<laughs> okay. So um, this uh, this lockdown learning session features uh, an old friend of mine, Ricky Agnew, uh, and I was trying to think of uh, the last time I flew with Rick, and and I thought, well, it was probably that time we went to Narromine in search of trying to fly mutual 500s with each other. And uh, we made a meal of finding a little half silo only 10 kilometres uh, south of Narromine, which makes me think we must have been still in the days of compass and map. Yes. Uh, anyway, we, we never got our 500, but we did have a, uh, a good weekend up at Narromine. Uh, I moved to Canberra in the early 90s and uh, lived there for, uh, for four years. And uh, during that time, uh, spent some time flying at the uh, Canberra Gliding Club at uh, Bunyan. And uh, I met Rick and uh, also uh, you'll see uh, a couple of other Canberra guys there, uh, Alan Wilson being one. Uh, Alan was always uh, one of those uh, happy-go-lucky happy tug pilots who uh, was insane enough to want to tow people into wave. Uh, towing into wave, uh, the, the only time I've I've done it deliberately to try and find the wave. Um, curiously, I didn't. Uh, but it's a hell of a ride uh, because quite yeah. often you're going up in into the rotor and it's very lumpy, very unpleasant, very fast. And you've got to make sure you've got a tug pilot who's uh, no clown. So uh, Alan's always handy in that regard. The only time I found a wave at Bunyan, uh, incidentally, was in a, in a blank and it was quite accidental. No one expected wave that day and... Richard Bill and I uh, quickly found ourselves at 10,000 feet, laughing at everybody as they uh, scrambled to launch and promptly missed it. So that was a, that was a fun day. Anyway, uh, to, back to Rick and not to me. Um, Rick spent some time uh, as an Air Force pilot. Uh, he, um, when, I know, when I knew him when we were both about 30 years old, he'd uh, spent some time in the secret squirrel world um since then he's uh, and you'll find out more about it he's uh, got into uh, mountaineering and he has a presentation on uh, mountaineering uh which i'm very curious to see as well he tells me he's uh, summited everest uh from the north side and halfway up the south side and is is still actively guiding uh people doing alpine sports in the kosciuszko region and and was actively guiding in uh in New Zealand and perhaps further than that. Uh, so he uh, he has a um, he has an absolute paranoia of tidal waves. So anything he can do to find himself high on ground or uh, high in an aircraft, he's very very happy. Uh, what else can I tell you about Rick? Well, look, I, I think we might just let his pack uh, uh, tell the story. Oh, he does have a, a doctorate in risk management, uh, so he can. Uh, quite happily tell you uh, uh, the risks associated with that. And there is one insane photo coming up. I won't, I won't spoil it for you, but it is extraordinary. And uh, uh, th you, after you see it and you think about the risks involved in it, you think, wow, uh, that's impressive. And I wonder if I would do it. So anyway, uh, everybody, oh, gentlemen, uh, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Rick Agnew. Rick is using his uh, his partner's screen, so he's cunningly labelled Francis Henderson, uh, but but his real name his real name is Rick Agnew. So, uh, in in terms of how I'd like to run, given that we've got quite a few folk here, if you do have a question, uh, just use the um, uh, stick your hand up. Uh, option which you, which you'll find under uh, reactions on your menu bar. The other thing is, uh, if you send me a question uh, through chat, uh, I can uh, just just through a, uh, a facilitation role uh, pose that to uh, to Rick uh, at a suitable time. But certainly, if you have some questions as we go along, uh, put your hand up, uh, uh, fire it up in chat, and uh, you know if it makes sense, we'll uh, we'll answer it on the spot. Um, Ready? How about you, Rick? Okay, before we go off this screen, how many uh, uh, are wave pilots? I know Al Wilson is, and Dave's been in one. They're all raising their hands. So, yes, so we've got experts. That's going to keep me honest. Very good. Um, so, constructive feedback is always taken. Um, 
Now, with Dave there, what I'm going to try to do is share my screen. What I've done is, as a true consultant, I can talk under wet cement. And if I start boring you, tell me to move on, move on, because this is one of my pet subjects, uh, Flying Wave. I've broken the slide pack into three components. Um, so the Robert, first... Uh, just just try sharing again. I've... Um... I haven't shared yet. Oh, okay. I can I just haven't yeah. enabled the setting. Uh, so the, the session, oh, I might, might do this. We'll start off. Okay. So you should be able to see that screen, Dave. Is that all good? Yep. I'm getting yeah, a thumbs good. up. Okay. So um, before I get on that, my intro, okay, as Dave says that, um, yep, burnt out raft pilot. Um, I started gliding in my uncle's uh, whippery club uh, up near Grafton Casino. Apparently I was boat ballast at age two. Uh, the family's got a history of flying. Um, I didn't go solo on purpose before going to the Air Force. In those days, they didn't want you solo. Um, and on the weekend, I used to fly at Point Cook, Tiger Moths and all that sort of stuff, CD4s, and then uh, over to Pierce, Jets and blah, blah, blah. And then back and forth to, to Canberra's headquarters and then over to America. Anyway, took up gliding in, in all seriousness, probably in 1977. Um, since then, flown all over the world. Um, we'll get to that. Um, why me is uh, my home club said, well, you don't know enough about this stuff. Um, you're spouting on about medical stuff. So I said, well, bugger that. So I did a postgraduate aviation medicine degree, uh, Monash Uni. So, I thought, well, yeah, it's probably king hitting it. So I know a little bit about that to be dangerous. The practicalities of flying wave. Um, this is me blowing my trumpet. Most of my Australian records and international records are speed and distance. Sorry, Rick, you'll need to click to just to advance the slide. Well, I haven't haven't done that. This is the intro. Um, and so speed and distance. And at one stage, I was the fastest standard glider pilot in Australia. Um, whether that's still the case, don't know. And of course, um, the altitude record I still get, and I get it every year unless I'm out of the country. Anyway, so this session... That's the intro. Um, then I'll do a brief history um, back in the day. What's Mountain Lee Wave? Um, what equipment you need? The dangers. And it's not all dangerous. You know, um, this is where my doctorate in risk management comes in handy. Um, how I fly wave, um, and it works for me. And I've used Australia, New Zealand, and Argentina as my case studies. I've also flown from France and Switzerland and the Alps. So. In the beginning, we all, all recognise that guy. Um, so that started it there. Then fast forward to Germany. Um, and I always, this amuses me, uh, no end. In Germany, after uh, the First World War, as you might know, the Germans weren't allowed a, a big air force. And um, so they all took up gliding. And that's why it's a super sport still to this day in Germany and uh, the Hitler Youth and all that. But anyway, they had this gliding competition um, and uh, Herf on this day 3rd of March there's a bit of an argument about whether it was on that day um, he actually flew um, I'm working two computers so I'll just move down on the other one it's worth I think reading his he stumbled into wave um, maybe this is the history uh, and bores you guys but there's several versions of uh, how, how they got into WAVE. And it goes something like this. Um, Wolf was visiting a German town uh, in, near the Polish and Czech border, uh, Gruno, and I'm probably pronouncing it all wrong. Um, and SD has a factory there um, soon after. Um, Edmund Schneider and all that sort of stuff, and the Gruno baby. Anyway. He was apparently talking to um, uh, a weather boffin and they're all researching into sort of what goes up, what goes down. And then he looked out at one of his students and uh, Wolf was the instructor and he noticed one of his students was flying further from the ridge. Um, they'd mastered ridge soaring and storm cells uh, storing, uh, soaring and pretty much 
the distances where you got up underneath a storm cell and you just did downward dashes. And I think the world record was like 180 kilometres or something like that, and that each year it got better and better. Anyway, Wolf noticed one of his students flying away and not in a cloud um, and near this other funny-looking cloud. So he raced, told all his students bugger off, um, pretty much in those terms, jumped into a glider and got into wave and basically didn't look back from there. So I could wax lyrical about more and more of that and how um, the Germans then went to America and they toured around and they actually flew gliders over New York City, um, amazingly, and concurrently some of them went to France, even though they were the sort of old enemy, and they used to do uh, gliding meets there. And concurrently, the, the Russians started doing um, some wave flying. So what is Mountain Lee Wave? And that's a classic photo of, uh, of water wave. So I've published a book with a Spanish guy 15 years ago in Spanish, and I'm doing a translation. So I should, we all stand on the uh, shoulders of giants. Um, we'd like to think we invented a lot of this stuff and stumbled it onto things. And some of us probably reinvented stuff because the instructors didn't really tell us some of it. Well, that was my sort of feeling. I had to rediscover some stuff um, when we flew at Polo Flat near Cooma before we moved, uh, Canberra Gliding Club moved to its current field. Anyway, so the factors that you need, um, atmospheric stability, a, a, a hill, or sometimes a valley can do it. And... Um, Airspeed, uh, the airflow increasing um, as you go up. So that's sort of like that. The best wave, which this is, there's different sort of waves, but I'm just going to talk about today classical mountain lee wave. If it's got a, a top inversion layer, makes the, uh, the wave stronger. So classically, if this is a mountain range, so um, there's wave sites all over Australia, as you know. And um, Jeff Vincent, who's dearly departed, flying the ultimate wave, he used to fly, and his colleagues now are still doing it, the Grampians. South Australia has got some wave. Western Australia used to fly wave there. Um, Cunningham's Gap, Queensland, New South Wales. And I'm slightly biased, but I think I've proven uh, the wave from downwind of the Australian Alps is the highest in Australia and, and arguably the best. So wind comes along, hits a mountain range classically, obviously um, can't go through the mountain, um, so it goes up. As it goes up, cold air gets heavy and it starts falling. Then ricochets. Now, it could ricochet off another air layer or that, but let's keep it simple. Ricochets off the ground and it bounces. And you get this, if you think about a rock in a creek bed, um, we go back to that. Uh, or that you can see it bouncing um, underneath you'll get a little sort of cumulus like cloud and as it gets more laminate we get these things called lenticular uh, clouds um, and as you see up in this diagram it's flattened out these clouds down here are rotor or roll clouds some people think oh they just look like a, a normal thermal cumulus nimbus uh, if it goes into storm um, they're not as and you can see it's evolving there and we can go into the um, the physics of this but we won't today um, a molecule of water vapor comes out there rushes over it superheats dissipates evolves another one forms so actually this cloud is a living breathing thing if you like and it's, it's fairly stationary depending on the wind strength it might move up closer or might drift downwind but pretty much they're stationary and so forth as you get lenticular. And this is a cap cloud on top of the mountain. Okay, where were we? So wind direction, there's your lenticulars. You notice how I've got an arrow there. Sometimes the pictures you see in some textbooks, um, even my one, uh, you have a little house and the smoke's going that way. And that, that can happen. Okay, <clears throat> the other thing, you physicists think about wavelength and amplitude. Um, depending on the, the uh, wind strength, um, the wavelength, horizontal distance between the crests, you can see on that diagram, and the amplitude. Um, and we'll come back to that. 
Okay, wavelength is determined by the direction and the strength of the wind striking the mountain. The slope and the angle of the height of the mountain lee side. So some uh, hills that are very uh, not cliff-like, um, nice weather-worn Australian uh, mountain ranges, they don't bounce it off. It's better if you've got um, young mountain range like New Zealand, <laughs> the land of the long uh, white cloud, forms wave, the Andes and the Alps. Himalayas don't produce a lot of wave. Um, Everest produces wave by itself, its own weather factory. Anyway, amplitude, and later on you'll probably um, be able to get this uh, either as a YouTube thing or I'll get this out to people. Okay, because I want to get to more to the photos because I think photos, photos tell a thousand words. Alrighty. Um, some of you guys have seen this sort of stuff uh, around the top of uh, a lenticular um, and the Kelvin Helmholtz turbulence at altitude. I always think that's quite cool. Um, I've actually never flown up in that. I've seen when I'm sort of soaring along there, it's happening further away from me. Okay, so that's a, a quick summary and you guys read better than I read. So the bottom line is you need wind over a mountain some people say 20 kilometers an hour, mm, yes, okay, but you want it increasing perpendicular to the obstacle, plus or minus, you know, 20, 30 degrees, um, works really well. Um, and if it's capped with the inversion layer, um, that makes it really bounce off and increasing with height. Sometimes it peters off and then the wave just dissipates. So that, that's sort of the, the physics, if you like, of classic textbook wave. Alrighty. So you get two levels, turbulent zone down around here um, and the laminar zone up here. Alrighty. Um, and we'll come back to this sort of diagram. Okay. The subconductory zone or, or the rotor area, the... Um, Whoop. this down here, whereas once you take off, and as Dave uh, in the introduction said, this can be like better than a roller coaster at a, a fun park, um, and uh, you want to have your straps tight and all the rest. So the rotors increase with wind and amplitude of the wave, strong winds, and uh, particularly uh, cause the rotor to be more violent and closer towards the ridge line, and there might be... Uh, some feature, orographic feature, that uh, kicks the wave off even more um, near Bunyan, and why we've got the Canberra Gliding Clubs at Bunyan, one that was uh, uh, an airfield we could buy, an old farmer's paddock, um, but uh, to the west of us there's a, um, uh, a gorge, and I think that kicks it off even more, <clears throat> helps the harmonic. So you can read all that sort of stuff, but the, the rotor typically... Um, is between ground level and three, four thousand feet. Um, when they all sort of join up, you get a nice, what we call a roll cloud like that. Um, and that, that's sort of music to our eyes, if there's such a thing. Um, so if it's a really good day, you get the tow pilot to tow you up and hopefully above that, and we'll get to that. And then once you're above it, there's techniques doing figure eights, um, in the, the strongest part of the lift. This is, of course, after you notch your barograph, and we'll talk about that. And there's ways of moving about uh, wave systems. So there's the wind coming down, escarpment there. It'd probably be better and stronger that way. Work your way up there, work there, and jump forward. Uh, different waves. Some of you thermal kings, and um, I must admit at narrow mine, you get shear waves and other sort of waves, and there's wave, and Inga Renner was the king of this. He never seemed to go round and round in thermals like the rest of us. Um, he'd find blue wave and disappear. So you'd be good telling me which way the wind's going. It's probably not going this way. It's either going this way or this way, and I'd suggest it's going this way. So it's going up, down, up, down, up, down. So fluid-like properties. I always think about the water. So how to predict wave. 
we're galloping through this, so if there's questions, pull me up. I always say rule number one, look out the window. And today was predicted to be a wave day. Um, I looked at Met charts and you skip down there. Um, good old sky site. So I believe uh, Matthew's given you guys a talk and his, his tool. Um, initially, I didn't really believe it. And maybe I was a tight ass. I didn't want to fork out the 90 bucks. Um, I have. And um, it's becoming uh, a go to for me, one of my predictive tools. But I always back it up with what the actual, uh, when I go flying and I compare, because it is still a prediction. Uh, if you want real time, you look out the window. So some of you new guys um, might not recognize this stuff because you're all computer boffins and you've never seen uh, isobars on, on charts and all that sort of stuff. Um, and even skew charts and weather balloons and all this good stuff. Um, and maybe uh, a meteorologist will tell you all about this. There's SkySight. And if you look closely, that's today. I did this um, two days ago. And this is over um, the coast is just off to the right. Um, and you'll probably recognize some of these names, Wagga. Um, uh, this is typically my hunting ground backyard. So uh, I'm looking for this sort of stuff. Okay, so you budding wave pilots, um, when you're sitting in lockdown and looking out the window and all that sort of stuff, maybe in Melbourne you only see sea breeze come in. I don't, I don't think you'll ever see wave there. When I was at Point Cook, there was the big um, dust storm that came in. <laughs> I remember that. But anyway, look for uh, rotor clouds, roll clouds, um, strong turbulence underneath there, uh, and. You've got to know your glider, and we'll get to that. Look at that a humdinger. More beautiful. That was in Argentina, so I can't lie. Again, Argentina. And you can fly up the side of that, no problem. Like a UFO. That was in New Zealand. Okay. As we say, it looks inviting. Can I reach it? Can I make it back? This is possibly when I'm flying. Uh, where can I land if I don't make it back? Are my retrieval logistics in place? Mobile coverage, driver, blah, 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 de-rigging tools, uh, alternate plans. Okay, equipment. That's one of the Canberra Gliding Club's uh, twin seaters, and that's me instructing. I've given up instructing. <laughs> they probably thought I was too mad. Um, so what I'm going to talk about really, and this could be a topic by itself, is oxygen systems. Um, I can go on and on and on, because basically that's what's going to keep you alive up high. Know your aircraft, all your performance stuff, instrument errors, v &E at different heights, uh, radio and clear view. We'll get to that. You've got to, before flying, you know, you turn up the airfield, if it's a normal cross-country day in the summer, you know, you, you, you get the chamois out, you wash the glider down, you're not worried about some water droplets. But if you're going to wave fly, um, as you go up higher, it gets colder. We all know that. Um, it'll freeze. And you don't want your dive brakes, for example, freezing closed. Um, and it can happen. Um, or moisture getting uh, in the ailerons or whatever. We, uh, when we do our Form 2s on gliders, um, especially the ones at Bunyan, uh, that we know we're going to use in WAVE, we use uh, low freezing lubricants on the controls because um, it's nothing sort of more alarming. You're flying and you, you try to turn and the aileron, it's, it sticks, it's just locked. And you, you know, your heartbeat goes through the roof. Batteries, we know you go, you know, batteries get cold. Um, it's trying to keep them warm and keeping yourself warm. Um, I'll talk about you know what the human can do dressing and keeping warm. But anyway, oxygen systems. There's a whole lot of different oxygen systems. Um, and um, I was just reviewing uh, the book in Spanish. My Spanish has sort of gone rusty now because it's three years since I've been to Argentina and uh, Frederico will have a go at me of translating. Anyway. It's got the history of um, continuous flow, on-demand, pressure-demand systems, 
And now, well, you all probably heard of um, the EDS type things, the pulse demand equipment, and everyone's nodding. That's the easiest, and it, they all have their own limitations. Now, if you're a squee in air, uh, like the RAAF, um, you have decent stuff and oxygen making systems on board and all that. So you've got to, got to know your oxygen uh, system, how to use it, um, get a briefing. Um, and Canberra Gliding Club, we've been talking about what's your secondary system. If your primary system fails for whatever reason, dead battery on these new EDS systems, um, you know, are you going to have the smarts to be able to change the battery? It shouldn't happen because if it's a serious flight, you'll probably put fresh batteries in. But where I'm going with this is there's various cannulas and mass and uh, not all mass all cannulas are um, equal and I talk about carrying a pulse oximeter so this is the EDS system most of you guys are recognized um, this is the uh, sort of a continuous flow you turn the little vernier down the bottom the bubble floats up uh, you can see 30 there they reckon this goes to 30 thou um, I've taken it to 30 thou. I don't use this sort of cannula. That's mine, but I don't bother. This is what they call a Sabre mask. Um, it's not a rebreather bag, but we typically call that a rebreather bag. It puffs up and down. Um, I'm modelling other stuff. Um, there's one of the Air Force stuff. I used to use this in the Blanick and all that sort of stuff. Um, this is part of my bailout bottle system. Um, military bailout, military mask, um, that's me with a helmet, and military, that's in a glider. Um, over in Argentina I use this, this tends to be more of an F, uh, civil aviation pilot mask. Different regulators, know your regulator. The good old days we used to have um, A13s and A14s, you know, they're, they're great, um, uh, but they use oxygen like there's no tomorrow. So the modern systems, and these, these are old German systems and stuff you see out of the Second World War and Korean War. Uh, this is more modern stuff. Um, the modern systems are very conservative on uh, using oxygen. Um, in Argentina, my Janta, I'd put six bottles down the back. You know, weight and balance sort of went out the window because I was using military systems because I was going over 30,000 feet. Oximeter, Nonan, I reckon is the best. When I bought my original one, it was about 270 bucks. Now you can get them down to, I don't know, $50. Um, there's limitation in using these things because if your fingers, extremities are cold, uh, the blood flows, a little laser goes through your fingernails. So us girls wearing nail polish, it's not going to work. Um, and the SO2 level, it's not a percentage, but because um, there's if it was 100%, there's argon and rare gases uh, within the atmosphere. It's not going to read 100%, but we like it to read 90 plus. Uh, if you're admitted into casualty in a hospital and you're below 80, I believe they'll put you on supplementary oxygen straight away and your heartbeat. That's what a good glider pilot should look like on a wave day. This is Keith in America. He's one of my uh, converts. He's keener than mustard. Um, and he spent a lot of money and he's even got the, his helmet too, like me. Um, so boots, stop your toes freezing. He's got a bailout bottle, um, plugs in uh, into the aircraft. And if he was really serious about going above 30 thou, you probably do pre-breathing to get rid of the nitrogen and all that. Price check. The Air Force used to teach this. Um, civilians don't use it so much and it's not, I haven't seen it around with the new GPT, but I still use it. So pressure, have I got enough in the intended flight? So if you're going to do a wave flight, you want to make sure your oxy bottle has got enough of what you want to do. If not, fill it up. Um, the regulators are working as it should. Indicator, the correct flow. A lot of these have a flow meter in it or a flash on the uh, screen. The EDS has got a, a little red light that flashes on and also a clicking. You hear it click as you breathe in. Connections, all hoses are connected correctly. Emergency. Um, so I go through the price check 
very regularly. And as I get higher, even more regularly, like every, every couple minutes. Um, you can see in this photo, that's icing from the condensation out of my breath inside the cockpit. And that can be potentially a bit of a worry. It gets cold. You see I've got jumpers and all that sort of stuff. Alrighty, Form 2 oxygen systems. They're refilling oxy, blah, blah, blah. I took these photos. This is what happened in Argentina. Um, the skin, skin graft did come back. Huge explosion. Um, he was a very, very lucky boy. Very lucky. The uh, Air Force used to show us um, at Point Cook when um, aviation medicine was there. It's since moved to Edinburgh in South Australia. But Ab Med used to say, come and watch these films. And the films were, are you stupid? And they'd have you know, some guy trying to get a uh, grenade and unwinding the top and it'd blow off and take his head and hands off. Uh, and it'd move on to a Claymore mine. The guy with a bayonet tries to prise it open to get the gunk out of it. Then they'd have an uh, American pilot from Vietnam and he'd put um, suntan cream on his face and an oxygen flash burn. And they say, we can rebuild you. So, uh, Rick, I've got a question from uh, Andre. Yep. Ask the question, mate. I can't see it. Andre, get your hand up, mate. <laughs> I think that's a glitch. I'll ask. Okay. No, no. He's scratching himself. That's, a, that's an old hand up. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep we're keeping a good eye on you. Okay. Thanks. Anyway, um, I don't put on lippies or suntan cream when I'm wave flying, just in case. Um, I've never personally heard of it happening, but hey, you don't want to be the first one. But I saw that, and that bloody hurt him. I can tell you. Some of you new guys to gliding wouldn't even know what that is. Some of us older people have used smoke barographs and then Rapogel barographs and then good old Mike Borgelt's Joey, which was a classic. And now you've got data loggers and buggery boxes all there and nanos. Um, when I fly, I, I take several data loggers because it's like the fish that got away. No one believes what you've done. Um, and now with OLC and... Um, all these uh, smarts, um, people are interested in what you've done. This is what I carry on with me. So I use now a EDS and um, I, I use a range of masks, a spare radio, my good luck charm, bailout bottle. I still carry all this junk and a paper map. Surprise, surprise. Um, I carry e perb, torch, thermal, uh, it's a space blanket, a flare. Um, Piddle bag, old Garmin GPS, and a knife. And that all fits into my Zoom bag. People think I'm mad. Map reading, a dying art, but I still do it. Believe in it. Read, 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 discuss it, read more, read. And yes, there's a lot of stuff out there. You don't have to believe it all. Bernard Eckie's uh, book, it's got a beautiful chapter. Of course it is, because I wrote it. Um, there's other books. Dangers. It's not all bad. So I'm going to go through the physiological effects. And this will be a, a, a very quick canter. So you medicos out there can say, yeah, you got it wrong. Um, pretty much it's all correct what I'm going to say. Equipment environmental. So the more you know about this, you know, um, and it's like they say, oh, you're lucky. The harder you work, the luckier you get. The more practice, the better you get. So us humans, dogs, cats, and other things, all need oxygen. As we know, the air is 21%. There's nitrogen and other rare gases. Fit person, yep, and we mentioned the blood saturation level, 95 to 100. Now, if you're an evil smoker, at sea level, you've already stressed your lungs, potentially to about 3,000 feet. So you're, you're okay at 3,000 feet. You're walking around, running, and kicking the ball for the kids and cycling. At 10,000 feet, where in Australia, legally, you could go on to oxygen, you're at 13,000. So you're probably getting a little bit woozy. Saturation, we mentioned before. And we mentioned there's the smokers. Lifestyle. When I do a lot of mountain climbing, especially in the Himalayas, I'm taking people 
up mountains such as Everest, which the south side of, uh, as Dave said, I've summited on the north side, saw the summit on the south side, but uh, I had to bring a guy back down. I could have summited, but I've been on Everest six times, and that's just one of the, the silly 8,000 metre peaks I've been on. And climbers talk about metres, not feet. But some of the fat guys, guys and girls, you think they're not going to make it. Slow and steady, they get there. Um, doesn't seem to, to knock them about. Partial pressure comes into it, and that's why at um, 33, roughly 33, 34,000, uh, just breathing um, pure oxygen is not going to be enough. Um, you need it forced into your lungs, and pressure breathing becomes the name of the game above that. And if you're not being trained in it, you'll be exhausted. So you have to <sighs> breathe it out as it's been forced into your lungs. And EDS won't, won't help you. Um, <laughs> you'll probably be dead. So the physiolog main physiological effects of high altitude flight in the human body can be summarized in the following. Hypoxia, hyperventilation, hypothermia, frostbite, decompression sickness. And you think, as a glider pilot, am I going to get any of this stuff? If you're wave flying, you could get all of that stuff. So let's talk about hypoxia. State of oxygen deficiency. Characteristics. They all say they're addictive, they're insidious, and all cause intellectual impairment. So typically, when you not get enough oxygen, it sneaks up on you. Apprehension, blurred or tunnel vision, dizziness, fatigue, eventually headaches, you might get hot and cold flushes, you might feel crook, might go numb, tingling, and the typical one, you feel like you're pissed. Um, you know, you had too many beers or alcohol, and it sneaks up on you, you think everything's pretty rosy. Warning, warning, warning. And this is, maybe when this is starting to happen, um, and you haven't got your little um, oximeter on your finger, it's all too late, because your fingers are probably blue and you're getting cyanosis. That's the second one. You might start an increased breathing, so hyperventilation could be starting. Your judgment's going out the window. At, at the really extreme, you start becoming totally uncoordinated. And if you're flying, that's not a good look. Mental confusion, and ultimately, you're going to go unconscious. So that brings me time of use of consciousness. And everyone's different, but this is what the textbooks pretty much say. So 15 thou, 18 thou, 22 thou, you know, 50 thou, it's in seconds. And how do we know this? <laughs> you can hop in dive chambers. And a lot of you guys might not have been in, the, in a decompression chamber or repetition chamber. So I organized the Canberra Gliding Club years and years ago, and this is some of the guys sitting in there. Um, when I did my AVMED, well, I'll finish on the dive chamber. So that you go in there, you're on oxygen systems, you sign your life away saying, if I have a heart attack or you know, I'm damaged, you're not gonna be suing the Air Force or whatever. Then everyone's sort of giggling and on that, and then they say, remove your oxy mask, and the symptoms of hypoxia start and you're watching your fingertips, and yes, they're starting to go blue, and you look at your mate's lips, and they're going blue, cyanosis. I get a tingling up the back of my neck, and then um, depth perception starts going. And after several minutes, they get you doing exercises like writing your name, and you think you're the, you've got the greatest handwriting, counting back from 100, um, doing sort of... Uh, clapping with someone else, you know, clapping their hands or um, uh, counting their fingers. And then you watch one or two guys slump over. And normally they have a instructor, uh, a life support, a LSTO, a life support training officer, some sergeant or, or something, um, puts the mask back on and switches to 100%. The person doesn't even realise once they come back uh, fully conscious, don't even realise they passed out. Of course, if you don't get an oxygen, brain dead. So that's a, sort of a lot of fun. But if it's done too quickly, or uh, the rumour has it in South Australia, uh, father-son glider pilot went in, the next day decompression sickness, and they got the bends. 
So what they do nowadays with uh, civilian pilots is what this top right hand is, is they mix the gases. They pump up the nitrogen mix, so the oxygen goes down, but you're not in a pressure chamber, so you don't get deep compression sickness. All the same effects occur. Um, and typically, uh, your hypoxic symptoms stay with you for life. So when I'm hypoxic, I get the tingling up my neck, I know, sheesh, turn up the oxygen or start descending or both big time. And when I'm mountain climbing, um, I was on Everest for two hours, 47 minutes on the summit. And that's a bee's dick short of 30,000 feet. I was without oxygen. Um, this might account why I'm brain dead, but anyway, I was functioning quite okay. So the bottom line is it sneaks up on you. You feel pretty good. Learn your own symptoms. If you can organize a chamber run, I'd recommend doing it. Um, a lot of the footballers and all that for uh, footy injuries, they get to go to chambers, so they're, they're available. I don't know what they charge. Okay, I mentioned hyperventilation. Um, when people hyperventilate, the, um, the acidity of blood level changes and all that sort of stuff, and typically you faint. The body says, I haven't got enough oxygen in the system because you're hyperventilating. You fall over. It's easier for the heart to, to pump blood around when you're flat instead of standing up. And sometimes the old school teacher used to give you a paper bag and you breathe into that. And that increases the CO2 content to help you to breathe and all that sort of stuff. So if you're thinking you hyperventilate, make a conscious effort of slowing your breathing down while you're on the oxygen mask. Hypothermia, frostbite, well, when I mountain climb, um, especially when I was in the Antarctic climbing Mount Vincent, the highest mountain in Antarctica, a hot day was minus 40, minus 30, minus 40. Um, so frostbite's a worry. As you go up, typically at 20 thou, minus 30, minus 40, that's not unheard of. And um, we're not walking around, so the blood's not flowing. So I wear these big moon boots. Some people have got electric uh, socks uh, that help them keep their toes warm. But uh, you've got to dress accordingly. Decompression sickness, I could wax lyrical about this. Uh, you get, basically there's two types. Um, type one is your leg sort of gets itchy or you get um, itchiness and you start wriggling around and all that. And what it is, is the nitrogen bubbles coming out of um, solution and um, fizzing out in capillaries near your skin and it sort of feels itchy. A lot of glider pilots have probably had it and never realized it's a very early decompression sickness symptom or of course they're itchy. Um, the worst ones you get the chokes, the bends, all that sort of stuff. It's a horrid way to die. They sort of discovered it when they were uh, building the um, San Francisco Bridge, back in the old days, they dug down and built pits and all that sort of stuff. And some of the uh, miners were getting decompression sickness before diving, but that's the history of it. And we can go on about that. Other things that you should be interested in as a glider pilot before your huge wave flight, get rest, fatigue. Don't get on the terps. You shouldn't be drugs, druggies anyway. Shouldn't be smoking, so give it up. I wouldn't be recommending eating a lot of cabbage and all that sort of stuff because uh, Boyle's Law, you know, it starts expanding in the gut. You've got to fart it or burp it out. Sorry, but it's true. Um, uh, dehydration. You guys know from your cross-country flying, start dehydrating, you get a headache, start making errors. You know, Decision-making goes out the window. Physical fitness. Noise and vibration. You might think, ah, what's that got to do with anything? But it, after a while, not only it gets noisy in gliders, and people think it's not so noisy, but it does in the vibration. It can fatigue you. Spatial disorientation, possibly motion sickness. Some of my colleagues get motion sickness. One, one of my friends, I won't name him, pretty much every time he flies, before landing, he, he has a bit of a bath, and he's a very experienced instructor. The Air Force, I remember at uh, AvMed, they used to take us into this room and there was a barber's chair and they 
they make you strip off and you wear a garbage bag. You sit in the barber's chair and they whiz this chair around. And they had some highfalutin name, you know, the desensitization machine. No, it wasn't. It was just a barber's chair that whizzed around. The human body says, chunder, you chundered. Luckily, I never had to do it. But some of my mates, they got scrubbed off course because they never got over their motion sickness. Um, anyway, it's something to be aware of. We had one of those at Duntroon when we turned 21. Yeah, they call it three P nights, pies, porn and piss, but we won't go there, you Duntroon cadets. Mm. Um, we spoke about evolved gases, um, you know, the tissues and fluids in the body. Um, as I said, it's not unheard of. Da -da 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 -da. Scuba diving. I used to do scuba diving. <laughs> um, these ex-SAS guys convinced me to come diving with them and I used to like that because it was free accommodation down the south coast and that. But then I used to think, oh, I've got to go flight. Big no-no. You, you'll kill yourself pretty quickly. You'll get the bends and die. So if you guys are scuba diving and you go flying, you're going to have to give up one or the other. You, you're not going to do both. Okay, there I mentioned type 1, headaches, joint pain. That's why they call it the bends, because you bend your arm or your leg to stop, sort of stop the pain. If you get any of this, or if any doubt, you, you go and see a medica and you say, I've been doing such and such. Okay, if any of this is suspected, and that's why I got it in red, initiate a descent, full oxy, control your breathing rate, check all your connections, and go all the way and land. There'll be another wave day. Um, story about the dead. I um, used to fly with Steve Fawcett, and you all probably know who Steve Fawcett was, multi and air. He got interested in setting world records. He, he swam across the English Channel several times. Um, then he got into ballooning, and I put him on to uh, John Wallington, the balloon aloft. And then um, he said, oh, I'm going to go to the moon. So... Star City, and he took John along. I didn't want to go to the moon, so I didn't go to Star City. And I was working anyway and couldn't get the time off. Um, anyway, then he rang me up and he wanted to do altitude records. And um, anyway, uh, he wasn't the world's greatest pilot. Terry Delore was flying in one day in Argentina and he said, Steve, Steve, you awake? What's going on? Terry wouldn't let Steve touch the controls. He was that shitty of a pilot he'd passed out hypoxic so terry descended they didn't land steve came to got him back on the mask and ship shape they went on to get a world record it's probably technically a no-no they should have landed could have probably given steve some brain damage um anyway so descended away the land as i said if there's any doubt don't fly if you're feeling crook you've got a head cold as you know you don't fly you're going to blow your sinuses out um, and it's going to be weeks if they get infected and all that sort of stuff. If in doubt, talk to your doctor. When I go wave flying, I tell my other half, you know, next couple of days, wave's going to happen. I fly the wave. I talk on the radio, do um, radio checks so people know I'm coherent or as coherent I will be. And when I land and go home, I normally ring my, my gliding buddy and I tell the other half, you know, this. And... Keep an eye on me for the next couple of days. Okay, on the glider, batteries, we spoke about getting cold. If you lose your batteries, there goes all your electronic stuff, maybe your nav aids, <laughs> hence why I carry paper mats, maps. Control cables, well, they start shrinking. Um, so you form twos. If you're going to fly in cold environments, make sure there's enough slack, but not too much. Ice inside the cockpit, I showed you that photo. That's not unheard of. Ice on and in the structure. Yeah, I've um, invertedly flown in a cloud, well, a lenticular formed around me, and I saw ice on the leading edge of the wing, and I thought, that's not good. Then it cracked off and hit the tailplane. If it was a big block of ice, hmm, worst case scenario, it takes my tailplane out, that's probably all over Red Rover. Not highly likely, but it could. So you keep an eye on that sort of stuff. Rule number one, you don't fly in clouds. Fix on the gel coat. Um, 
Dave Peach, Air Commodore Dave Peach, AM retired. He's um, you all known from South Australia and then came up to Canberra Gliding Club. Um, we got him into Wave. He was a late bloomer into Wave. He probably won't like me saying that, but he was a late bloomer in Wave and he's highly proficient pilot. Um, he's done a lot of work on gel coats and polyurethane and a lot of Canberra Gliding Club gliders that had schwazelac and all that. You look around the dive box, you get cracks. Not a good look. Moisture gets underneath there, delaminate, then it's going to be expensive. Our DG303, we had it re gel cut or refinished with um, polyurethane, the wings, 16,000 bucks. And that was cheap. Um, and that's because people descending too quickly, cracking up their aircraft finish. So things to think about. Oxygen systems, no grease or dirt. You saw the photo of um, <laughs> Juan. Um, he'll never forget it, I'll never forget it. And he had greasy hands, this stupid idiot. Um, but I'm paranoid about when I'm refilling oxygen. It's a sort of solo game. And um, Paul Wiggins comes up with a paper bag and pops it behind me and I just had shit myself. Um, yeah, maestros like that or bangs the side of the, the metal hanger. Again, they see me go through the hanger. I've seen the top of an oxygen bottle uh, break off and it took off like a torpedo. And at um, Luke Air Force Base, I was looking over the F-15 uh, triple nickel flight line and um, three F-15s disappeared. And the coronal inquiry never got to the bottom of it. The oxy truck disappeared too. So be careful with oxygen. Always maintain positive pressure in your oxy bottle. If it goes to the zero, moisture could get in, and that means rust. And if you get your bottle tested, it could come back in two halves, and that's the hydrostatic test. And I've been banging on about masks. I, this is a COVID scruffy beard. It'll come off if I fly a wave. Um, the Navy pilots, birdies, they always say, oh, Navy, I must grow a beard. Well, <laughs> Okay, yep. How many of them got hypoxic in the in the various wars because they had a beard and the mask didn't fit properly? Don't know. Okay, getting organised in the cockpit. It's sort of like when you're converting or going uh, first time in a glider. Sit down, get comfortable. You're wearing your Michelin Man outfits. You know, make sure your data log is on. <laughs> I've fallen for this. Done a brilliant wave flight. Come back. Official observers looked at it and said. Where have you been? Well, it's on the logo. Go and check it. He said, you didn't switch it on. You never flew it. Well, that was one Australian record out the window. Yeah. Oxygen on. Yes, I've done that too. So excited. You know, didn't sleep the night before. Get down on the launch pad because everyone is like the Battle of Britain rushes there. Launched. Can I turn around 180 in the aircraft and turn it on? I've done it once. I just figured out, you know, they find the wreckage of the aircraft and figure out how's Rick turned 180 in the aircraft and broken his back. Boston. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, he he's in the up the back of Queanbeyan, so uh, the, the connection connectivity can be a bit of a problem. He'll be back in a moment. Um, good to see you, Kerry. Hi. <laughs> well, you made it there. Um, a few other the Geelong usuals, but uh, um, are, are there any any questions or uh, uh, comments or thoughts uh, whilst we're waiting for Rick to come back? I think if you're going just if you're trying to do diamond heights, so you're only going say twenty thousand feet. I mean, do you still need bailout oxygen and stuff? I've never heard of people taking that with them. It'd be interesting to know his view on oxygen up to 20,000 rather than 30,000. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, that's a, it's a fair point. I mean, when he starts, when he gets to the part of the presentation where he's in the Andes, he'll, uh, he'll be talking about uh, much higher altitudes. Just go with the mountain high for diamond, for example. Sorry, Paul, you're cutting out there, mate. Is that why? Oh. 
Dave, is it fair to say that Horsham's not going to happen this year? Uh, I was just watching uh, the Commissar give his uh, briefing today, and I think he's wanting to open up the state in time for Cup Week. For by, Cup the end of, by the end of October. So we will just squeak in. Mm. Maybe. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Mm. The roadmap says 80% fully vaccinated by the end of October, 26th of October, roughly. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I'm... Yeah, that's right. Just excuse me. Where'd you go, big fella? <laughs> Welcome back from your little interlude. Okay, so make sure you can reach everything. Uh, there's not a lot of room. Some people, when I used to fly uh, the Janta, now I own a 55, I'm still figuring it out. Uh, the Janta, people say, where's all this stuff fit? Well, I've got 4,700 hours just in Janta 2s. I own a Janta 2 in Argentina. So I've got a lot of time in Janta 2s. I know where everything fits. So you and your glider should know where everything is. Um, and I have little doggy bags with strings on it and all that sort of stuff. Harness. Make sure it's firm and you can tighten it up. Um, we just changed our Club DG303 harness because it had sweat and all that. It looked brand new, but you couldn't bloody tighten it. Um, and when you're in rotor, and we'll get to this, boy oh boy, you can be plus or minus, you know, 4 or 5G, most people black out at 5G, but yep, uh, one of our tow pilots dislocated his hip. And we had to pull him out of the aircraft uh, from rotor. Maps, airspace and frequencies. Know your frequencies. I won't go bang on about indicated airspeed and true airspeed, um, but go away, think about it. And that's why you have a placard in your glider. I know that some instruments uh, automatically talk about True airspeed, uh, these new LX uh, air data instruments. And I've got one, yet to use it properly. Um, but basically, you don't want to fly through V&E at height. Other hazards. Well, turbulence, we're going to talk about that. Weather. Foam gap. There's different ways of spelling this German word, and we'll show you pictures of that. If it closes, the cloud closes over because it becomes more moist and the wave, uh, the wind strength drops, typically the wave starts breaking up and you're up high, suddenly you can't see the ground, your heartbeat goes up and you could be lost above the cloud. Typically you fly downwind and you'll see a way out, might mean an out landing. Penetrating cloud is not a good look. Uh, you read the textbooks and various gliders, they say, uh, practice putting it in a uh, shallow uh, turn, take the hands off, full dive brakes, and let it go. And it should just spiral down by itself. You think? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, and they say, practice this. Yes, well, I've had some scary stories uh, myself. And the clouds sort of zunk closed in underneath me. And I thought, I'm well above the, the uh, cumulus granite this was in Australia but flying in the Andes and in the Swiss Alps boy oh boy you fly into a mountain you won't do it a second time okay oxygen malfunctions you don't muck around you just descend uh, there's not much you're going to be able to fix while you're flying if a connection you know comes loose and you see it Good luck to you. you. You can plug it there. That's why I do the price check and I'm checking it constantly. Okay. End of daylight. September, you know, 610 around there. Got to think about this shit. Yeah. 20, 20 thou. <laughs> um, and I'll show you some photos. 20 thou. Do the mathematics. I'm not a mathematical giant. Navigators do the maths and calculators. But even dumb me can figure out it takes a bloody long time to come down. Okay, 55 minutes. That's an hour in my language. All right. 
So you're stooging around. This is me flying. And look, the nice sun out there over Lake Jindabyne. Looks all pretty good. And I thought, better come home. Most of the Canberra Gliding Club people have you know, short bladders. So they'll have had three hours. And I'm up there six, coming seven hours, frozen. Pop dive breaks. Looking at the sunset. What? Sunset? Huh? And on <laughs> this stage, I was at 24th hour. Oh, look at the bottom of there. Have a look at that. Mm. What's the time say? Mm. <laughs> um, I shouldn't say. I got grounded for six months for this. I shouldn't shouldn't say it, but I did, and I deserved it, and I probably deserved more. Um, I figured out Kuma Township. Yep, it had lights. There was the snow traffic. That was the highway. There was Breadbow, north of our airfield. Yep. Hey, guys, can you put some cars on the runway? And that's what happened. And I had to front the instructor's panel as an instructor. It wasn't a good look. So don't do it. Okay. Pilot preparation. Physical fitness. Yep. I reckon the fitter you are, the less oxygen you need. Mental fitness. Yep. Warm clothing. I always have my little beanie, gloves, different gloves, gloves on gloves, and my tootsies. I don't, maybe because, you know, the Air Force, I had ground crew, I'm pretty rude um, before I fly. I tell people to bugger off because I do my uh, thoughts about flying. And I used to be a comp pilot, and yes, I used to win days and comps and all that sort of stuff, burnt out has been, and used to beat some of the guns on the fluky days, uh, having bad days, I used to think. Anyway, so I, I go through... And I used to be part of the Institute of Sport and um, they used to train us as marathon runners and that. So you, you think about what's going to happen. This is before you start your chaotic and you check. And if anyone comes over and they say, oh, where do you think the wave is? I go, can you go away? I'm about to do my checks. Um, and blatantly, they, you know, I start using the F word and all that sort of stuff. And they go, God, he's rude. Well, it's going to be my flight. I don't care about you land lovers. I'm going to fly. And typically, the early bird gets the worm. I'm typically the first one to, to launch. Or I'm the second. Because then the, the tug pilot says it's too rough and then won't launch anyone else. So you want to be first on the grid. You want, don't want to be, the French word, dicked around. Okay, so I have a trusted um, buddy who knows that I'm twitchy will hand me my stuff as I'm in the glider, hand me my water bottles, hand me my camera, hand me this, hand me that in the right order. I'm a bit of a prima donna that way. But hey, the proof's in the pudding, in the eating, or whatever they say. Okay, scroll on to the next one. Flight planning. Yes, none of this happens by sheer fluke. Yes, you can, Dave, stumble into wave and all that, but you knew how to fly and your colleague knew how to fly so I get excited. I'm looking at wave and we're trying to get predicting it a week out or two weeks out. Um, yeah, I reckon three days. Agnew's got this great idea, full moons, plus or minus a couple of days of full moon. You get king tides, king tides and tides affect wind, strong winds and fronts, prefrontal, ski season, more likely you're going to get wave. Think about what you're going to eat and get sleep. Forecast, we just went through that. Official observers. Well, I used to be official observer until people hassled the shit out of me, so I'm not an official observer, selfish bastard that I am. I'll have to do it again. But you've got to line one up. And uh, the badge lady, um, she she is a neo-Nazi for good reason. Um, people have cheated in bef uh, records and stuff before. Um, so organise your official observer. Find out what you have to do, the official observer doesn't tell you what you have to do, they just observe. Get a trained tuggy. Some tuggies are more equal than other tuggies. I'm biased. I groveled and I made my tuggy a syndicate partner in my glider. He's only probably just dawned on, he doesn't fly the glider, he flies, flies the tug to launch me in the new glider, or the 55, and have a competent ground crew. And we talk about at Camera Glider Club, rule number one, duh, you have to be there. 
There's no point ringing up from Canberra or wherever and say, what do you think the wave's on? I'm not interested. I'm, I'm on the flight line or I'm driving down. I'm already in the zone. Be methodical. Yes, I grew up with checklists and my one little neuron gets overloaded. I used to even have uh, a laminated checklist and a, a bit of elastic for gliding with my chaotic on it and aerobatic you know, checks. Um, yeah, couldn't believe it. Um, even did the instructors. I progressed past that. So prepared. Practice, practice and practice more. Get in your kit, do it. Okay, so you're driving down, safe driver, glider. There's Dave Peach. Mm. Tug. Klaus's Demi. Don't race around, don't get sweaty. Here's Paul Wiggins. Um, Dave, he's moved to Queensland. Um, whatever, anyway, this is me getting my kit on and I tell people to bugger off. Chat up the tow, tow pilot, getting all stuff ready. Much of the same. Post flight, before you leave the airfield, it's like watering the horse. You know, top up your oxy. I know you're tired and everyone wants to go home. Do it, do it, do it. Download flight instruments probably at home or get your official observer. Putting the glider to bed. Always shout the tuggy, grovel to the tuggy, pizza, whatever he wants, analyze the flight, and then you're starting planning for the next flight. Okay, come on. So, topping up oxy system, I would tell, if this was me, that's Paul Wiggins, Stu Ferguson, Les Kingsley, Stewie's our tug master, Paul is one of our senior instructors and one of the maintenance gurus now coming up through the ranks, and Les is comp pilot, LaBelle. I would, if that was me, I'd say these guys, please go away, leave the hangar, just in case. There's Al Wilson, when I was younger and less blonde, always keep my tuggy happy. Flight analysis, I use CU, I used to have Strepler, some of you guys never heard of it, it used to be Ducks Guts, CU, I know the boys in Slovenia. Um, OLC. Justin, XRAF, now RAAF, um, he's stationed in Canberra. So have a look on OLC. Justin, as known as Fitzy, Fitzy's been doing some brilliant flights, up and down, up and down, up and down. I get bored, but you know, 1,000 Ks, possible. This was this season. Mm. You know, so he goes up and down, up and down, up and down. To me, OLC, yes, I haven't bothered putting it on there and Wilson and others chip me for it. I reckon it's cheating. I do my thousands properly, out and return, you know. Bloody no diamonds before breakfast. Okay. Yeah, badges before breakfast. Yes. Okay, I think... Um, We're over this one and we change horses. Anyone want to get a coffee or anything like that? Well, why don't we just declare a, um, a quick two minute break uh, uh, for uh, participant comfort? All right, because yeah. the next one to whet your appetite, I talk about how I fly wave and with photos, Australia, New Zealand and Argentina. So those who are not interested, Stay for the first little bit, and if you're not interested in New Zealand or Argentina, where it's the best in the world, bar none, you can go. All right, I'll, I'll hurry up and wait. You guys, Dave, you tell me to wrap it on or whatever. Okay, well, look, uh, um, let's t talk amongst ourselves. Or if you need to go and get a cup or a drink uh, or uh, the opposite, uh, please do so now. Come straight back. Mm-hmm. It's just about quarter past uh, five now. Mm. Okay, so we'll kick off at uh, uh, quarter past. You got a, a minute, minute and a bit. Mm. You've heard all this before, Kerry. 
right? Yeah, you know all this stuff. I don't, actually. I don't do wave. <laughs> uh, it took me years. with Heinz Fursanger and uh, people like John Rowe back in the old days, Mick Doyle from uh, Narromine. Narromine, yeah. This would have been back in the uh, mid-70s. They taught me cross-country and comp flying. I didn't even know Wave existed until I went to um, Canberra Gliding Club and um, Heinz Fursanger, ex Luftwaffe pilot, he goes, Lick, Lick, there's better things, there's Wave, and I think, whatever. And it is the best. And what you like. Ah. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, okay, well, um, Let's uh, let's get into the main course then, Biggest Rickers. All righty, Wayne and Brian and whoever. You know, I'm back. He's back. <laughs> All right. So I'll kick off. Those who are not there will have a look on the video later. So Canberra Gliding Club um, is Bunyan, which is 12 k's north of Cooma. This is our ha happy hunting ground. Uh, down to Jindabyne typically, and now we're going further afield. Infermal as as well as uh, wave. Um, we've been negotiating with uh, on behalf and with Gliding Federation of Australia GFA. I still call it that GA Gliding Australia. GA is a stupidity. That's, hey here. Yeah, it's GA is you know general aviation. Anyway, we lost a marketing thing there. I won't go on to that politics like Formula One. Anyway. At the moment, we're renegotiating airspace, getting back um, letters that we've had for a very, very long time, many, many years, 20, 30 years, allowing us to leave Class G into Class E. Um, who's got the gold makes the rules, meaning Qantas and Virgin and Rex don't want gliders, glider pilots anywhere near this, but we have, uh, and doing it safely. This is out of uh, Australian Geographic from 1986. And there's a guy, um, I'm hopeless of names, he'll come to me. He was a- Dominic Williams. Nope, nope, not at all. Um, he was, he's a, moved from Jindabyne. He used to fly- oh, Barry Renford. Yes, mm. Barry Renford, oh, thank right. you. Got it. So Barry, um, he was one of the, uh, yeah, I like to think fathers of Australian wave, along with Heinz Fursanger, Freddie Goigus, and there's others. So I'll get into trouble not mentioning all the names, but um, uh, this was an article back in those days, and I like the picture. All right, this is what you want if you fly at Bunyan, because I, this is all the secrets. This is the secret map. And these black lines show the wave, the dotted lines show where it's weak. Anyway, we'll go into this. So you drive down, you get your gliders, you tow it out. Wills will recognise that. That's his car, my 2B car, and our 55. Um, came from um, Hunter Valley. Mm. There's the old club Janta that's no longer. Unfortunately, I nearly, nearly killed the pilot that killed the Janta. So you line up, you hook up, you tow. Now... As I said, not all tow pilots are good wave tow pilots. We love them all, but um, what we want is you don't want to lose sight of the tug. That's going to upset your day. Um, and it can be rough as all get out. Hopefully, if you take off early in the morning, the rotor hasn't really got up and the thermal layer hasn't got up. You could go, if you're lucky, straight into the laminar flow. But... Often than not, it's going to be a roller coaster ride. Um, and wave flying is more advanced flying, I would argue, than just normal cross country flying. You'll get loops in the, in the rope, you'll be out of station, so you've got to concentrate. And the, the power pilot's concentrating like all get out anyway. So you can either release underneath the cloud. Um, or get towed into the wave above the cloud. So this is thermaling the rotor, 
10 plus metres. This was in Argentina. That's a metric, stupid metric altimeter. Drove me nuts. Anyway, typically this is what the wave's doing. So you'll see this scattered little cumulus like cloud. This is rotor, roll cloud. So that S steer is just getting into the wave. I'm just getting into the wave here. The wind's coming from the right hand side of the screen up and over. There's our round paddocks, good navigation aid. So sometimes the roll clouds all join up and you get this and you get the flat and it just looks like a cumulus. And if you're underneath it, it could be rough as all guts and you work your way up in a thermal in the rotor there and you work, gather speed and the kinetic energy and come out the front. And if you're lucky, you pull up and you could catch the laminar flow and you'll be in the wave. If not, boom, you try it again. Sometimes it might take you an hour and it's being in a mix master underneath and it can be rough as all guts and you've been in rough thermals you know it might be half a knot up one side two knots down or it might be six knots up one side eight knots down the other side um, and instantaneous once you're in it it's all good you work your way up so get stable don't get all uh, greedy and start spearing off into the never never get established and above the, the uh, roll cloud here and you can see a lenticular layer starting to form different ways of uh, moving around um, in in um, in wave this is out of my Spanish book with my co-author and I'm translating into English so typically thermal your way up in the rotor get into above the, the roll cloud, do figure eights. Uh, sometimes you'll be doing it out there, depending on the slope of the cloud. Sometimes it might be way out there or it might be on top. Work your way up, gaining height, and figure out what's going on. So I should be asking you guys where the wave is. So the wave line's along there, a little bit of scuddy cloud there, a little bit there. So that's one line along here. Next line is that's a bit there, but it's broken off from here. Flying along here, this is Lake Jindabyne. There's a little scuddy line there. That's where you want to be on that, that slide. That's where it's stronger. So wavelengths moving up. Cooma Airport, Cooma Township's back here, Bunyan's back over our uh, left shoulder. Jindabyne, working your way up on the side of the cloud, as we mentioned before. Look at that, that highway, you can zoom all the way along there, or, and you can see how that, I call these fingerings, so it's pointing out there, pointing out there, pointing out there, pointing out there. I reckon what's happening is the wind is pulsing and the uh, the ground structure is causing it and the wind and the laminar flow is stronger there and it's weaker down here. So I would go fly about here, work my way up, working up higher, 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 eventually either jumping forward to this next wave band and you want to be height because you want to go over the top there following the arrow and sometimes you stuff up and you go pew, straight down the back and you remember from the, the physics of it the winds coming back and over and down this is all down this is sink in the foam gap uh, then it's bouncing back up and so on so when you're up high you're aiming to, to get in front of that cloud if you make a muck it you end up there thermaling in the rotor <laughs> or coming back and hopefully zooming back with the tailwind behind you, ground speed huge, um, uh, and you'll, you'll recontact the wave or you'll be back into the, uh, the rotor layer. Here you can see the line of wave, like a sea breeze. This convection uh, um, area there. This, this one, Paul Wiggins and I was flying different aircraft, but you can see that arch. That was great. I zoomed in there, but that closed in. Paulie couldn't do it. He had to come back. Um, I got higher and got into this higher layer.
Okay, we'll see if this works. Whoop. I even have a video to show you. Look at that. This is about a month ago. that thing down so the wave um, is that strong um, especially down low typically it, it's uh, very strong up high so in the roll uh, rotor area you're working your way up and between depends what the cloud uh, the rotor base is typically you can go early in the day from ground level bunions to two and a half thousand AMSL and you'll get a launch into wave at a 6,000 foot launch, so big bucks. Um, and then you're in the laminar flow and you'll go from here, uh, maybe six, seven knots all the way up, then it'll slow down. And then once you get into this lenticular layer, it'll speed up again. Typically what I do is go up to 14,000 and then go up to Breadbow and jump forward. Um, this might be 12 kilometers distance, might be five, six kilometers, but that sort of order. This is up at Kosciuszko, uh, the range, and the wind swings around, so I have to be in front of that. Agnew's elevator, they call it. Al Wilson's got Wilson's elevator, which is on the wrong side of Jindabyne. Pulling dive brakes. Um, it's amazing. Sometimes you don't want to go up too high. You either increase your speed or increase speed and dive brakes. So we've mentioned about how jumping up systems get up high the first times you do it because you're going to lose potentially lose a lot of height. Um, maybe five, six, seven thousand feet um, in minutes. So, you know, if you glider A, we want to be over here, this guy, I have, haven't done it properly, this guy going through sink, gets that sinking air there, made it there. What you want to do is just draw a straight line and end up here and then up you go. You want to stay in that laminar zone. If you miss if you come back and hit it like that, this is what happens. You start getting that old pucker feeling, thinking I've stuffed up. I haven't got a uh, gyro. I'm not cloud uh, allowed to fly in the cloud and all that sort of stuff. I was okay at this this time. You've got to keep a good lookout because your buddies are everywhere. There's Paulie Wiggins' little bell. He's still flying there. Yep, still flying. This was uh, Jindabyne, and the snow uh, train goes in there. Spot the plane. That was a Dash 8. He nearly took me out. I could see the idiots, wonderful pilots, reading the newspaper. Boy, they must have gone ping, fasten your seatbelt, slight turbulence as they <laughs> zoomed out of the way. I had full um, rights of way, but you don't, don't question. I got into his uh, prop wash. Hell. So you don't want to get stuck above cloud. You see in this photo, there was a way out also in front. Typically, if, if the wind slows down and slows down in the moisture content, the cloud, the foam gap closes and you think, uh oh, big trouble. Mm -hmm. Typically, if you go downwind. That's me larking about. You have to have the wing in the photo. That's Jindabyne. But what this means is if you're out there, oh, here's your freezing level again. Different mask. Scratching <laughs> the ice off. Here's one of my uh, knee pad things. That was um, uh, V&E's at height, I think. Um, flew into Canberra legally, got permission. 
Mm. I think I'm the only one who's ever done it. Um, this is uh, the Alpine Way, Kosciuszko. This is the Australian altitude record on 25th of August 1996, Curvature of the Earth. Mm. They gave me 33,000, but it actually was 33,762 feet. So to beat it, you've got to beat it by 3%. So you're going to go to 34, 35,000, meaning you're pressure breathing, and good luck with that. It was bloody cold. Mm. Dive breaks. So you're going down. Think about last light. Mm. Nav aids. We're lucky we've got these huge big irrigation paddocks. Um, the wave comes off Kosciuszko range there, comes down this escarpment, bounces. Um, Jindabyne, as I mentioned, bailout strips. There's Jindabyne airfield. It's not a great airfield, and that's why Barry Renford moved, because um, it's got a, the wind roars there, and they've built up a, a bank. Um, and the council's going, apparently they're putting lots of money in there, but it's not a great place to outland in wave. Um, think about your landing because remember that rotor I told you about? <laughs> it's probably even got worse as the days got better for high altitude stuff in the laminar flow. But all your colleagues um, going into landing, this is when you want a working radio and you ask, you know, uh, the landing ground, you know, wind direction and conditions. So know your strips, Kuma Airfield, Adamitami. Yes, I landed there. There's the Janta. It's no longer. And the other day I landed there. This was my flight. And you see what I've done here? Thank you, Matthew Scudder. I um, flew along the predicted, but then I <laughs> landed there. And they came and got me and all that sort of stuff. But it admitted me to become a very nice airfield. See the windsock? It was easy peasy, beautiful. Polo Flat, this is an old photo of Polo Flat near Kuma. Now Snow 2.0 has built a uh, um, cement factory there. Uh, state government's putting serious money to upgrade that airfield. And sometimes you land in Farmer Joe's paddock. Moon boots, blah, blah, blah. So you've got to dial up all your mates the outlanding and shout the bar, etc., etc. There's our windsock. It can be miserable when you're coming into land. Look at all this. It's rainstorms going through on this day. Miserable, miserable. Okay, I got bored of flying in Australia, so I thought I'll go to New Zealand, land of the great white cloud. So you all heard of Omarama. This dates the photos because they've got more more sheds there now, and um, Gavin uh, Wills and all that it closed it down, but now it's opened up. Gavin's retired, like I've retired, but he's retired from his school. There's Gavin. Um, he was one of my early teachers, and apparently you know, I actually passed, whoopie doo. Um, he liked me so much, he brought me back. So for three seasons, I was a paid instructor, like G. Dale. Yeah, unbelievable. Um, the Kiwis like polishing rocks. I don't like polishing rocks. I ridge saw, but not the way Gavin does. I like going high. This is going up Ben Omen. There's Mount Cook. Would I climb Cook? This is Elizabeth's um, step side. I came up the other side. But you can see the wind's coming up and over. There it is. And I climbed Cook when it was 16 foot high. They had an earthquake and the top fell off. So there you go. And it's a serious mountain, actually. You know, people die on it. And the lakes, as you know, if you haven't been there, they are this, this colour. And you don't want to outland. And there is a rumour that one guy, he, he um, got caught above cloud and he decided on parachuting. He survived the parachute landing, but he, uh, they found him dead with broken back. He got blown along the ground and hit a, um, a fence post. Killed him. So you've got to think about outlandings and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I don't have that video. I'll have to move on from that.
I think now we go to Argentina. Are there questions so far? They're all stunned. So I got bored of flying Australia and New Zealand. I went to the Alps. And then I got talking to um, Dr. Osvaldo Ferrando, uh, who's a lawyer in uh, Argentina. Lawyers are called doctors. So I always wind him up. And he said, well, you're not a real doctor. And I said, well, either are you. Anyway, so I started going there in um, 1999, I think. And the same year, one new pilot, Klaus Ullmann, decided to go there. He'd never been there either. So we sort of arrived at the same time. And our racetrack was from a little town called Chosmalau, known as Chosma, uh, to El Calafati, 2000 Ks. There's the Andes, this is our play playground. And I've flown the Pampa, I've gone in the competitions there, and the Argentinians are lovely people. Um, Chosmalau, all those um, towns along the border of Chile are there to stop the Chileans invading, literally. They'd been, at that stage, just finished a hot war. They had about eight wars, um, shooting bang bang wars um, with Argentina um, through the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s. They don't fight as much now. Anyway, at each, uh, between 300 and 700 Ks, they have a military strip. To fly in Argentina, you have to send over your passport. Well, I don't send my passport to in the post to anyone. So you have to get what's called an apostle something something and a special lawyer stamps it. You fork out about 750 bucks. You take it to Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Canberra. They have to authorize it and that becomes equivalent. There's all my gliding stuff. Um, they didn't have a GPC in those days, but the um, Argentinian Air Force runs all aviation in Argentina. So you send this over and then they'll think about it. And you arrive in Argentina and you go to Air Force headquarters and you spend all day because it's bastardization. Because I fly Mirages and they all fly Mirages. I become very close friends with the deputy uh, Argentinian um, head of Air Force and I got my license to fly. Um, helicopters, power planes, jets, and gliders. I only wanted to fly gliders in this case. Um, and you have to do this every year. And I, I've been there 22 times. Oh. So, and they say, gringo, gringo, your Argentinian Spanish is not good. They all speak English. Well, a lot of them do. It's not bad, my name. So that's the Pampa. That's Chosmalau Airfield. It's a military airfield. Yes, yes, showing off. That's my wing, so I stand it up on its wingtip. That's Chosmalau. And that's a normal day. The Roaring Forties hit the Andes, and downwind is the wave. And it's going. The problem with Argentinians, they're lovely people, but they've got the Spanish bug. Everything's hurry up, or manana, you know, tomorrow. They don't get out of bed until 10, 11 in the morning. They go into work, public servants or people, for about an hour, and then they come home at the siesta, and they waddle back to work about four, work to about, I don't know, seven o'clock, go home, have a bit of a snooze. Dinner is midnight to one. And I said, no, 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 I want my dinner about eight o'clock. What? Even the kindergarten children don't eat then. So trying to get them out of bed at day sun up to launch me into the wave, it was hugely impossible to begin with. Yes, I was svelte James Bond lookalike in those days. You notice I took out the uh, the cow canopy cover there, um, keep my feet warm. That's my Janta, uh, still there. So you're going up, unbelievable. Then suddenly you're going down, unbelievable, and the old pucker factor. And then you see cumulus granite. And then you think about outlanding. This is the main highway to Chile from Argentina. And that white dot there, every year I go and paint the heading on it. The local police hate me. You'll notice, you'll notice that there's no stupid telegraph poles or, you know, verge signposts. Because all these highways are military aircraft capable. Because they use them when, you know, a war. Yeah, 
and taxi strips. That was an outlander by one of our guys, many Nimbus. So at this stage early on, uh, we didn't have the Mountain uh, Gliding Club, which I helped on the inaugural, one of the inaugural founders. So this is a typical day, got in a wave, flying up here, giggling like you wouldn't believe. I was about, uh, this, this photo is about uh, 24, 25,000 feet. And you're flying along, zipping along, and suddenly you zip along and you go, oh, not good, not good. Can I turn around in that? Oh, above cloud, below cloud. I worked it out. But those sort of things you don't do because you die. Argentina, there's no search and rescue. You die. And you heard about the football team. They were flying uh, into Chile to play football, soccer. Um, they speed in. Mm. So some survive by eating the others. They were actually rugby players. Yeah, uh, you're right. Rugby, rugby players. I lie. I was just thinking that. Soccer um, players could never come to cannibalization. Well, correct. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and if they went, if they walked half a K um, to the west, they would have found a little village. But they decided the two who nominated to walk out, who are alive, obviously, um, they went for like days. And they took bits of body part to nibble on. Anyway, this is what you do in Argentina. Sometimes you see volcanoes. This is Volcano Truman. And it's active. There's a lot of hurry up and wait. A lot of hurry up and wait. That is the Andes. On the right-hand side is Chile, left-hand side, Argentina. No search and rescue. So this is, became my backyard. I got to know uh, Domujo, the highest mountain in Nukan province. I've climbed that. Um, there it is. And it's the Killer Mountain. Um, the wave is really good just over there, but it's shit down here. Oh, that's a French technical word. We don't talk to the French. Um, these are my navades, little volcanoes um, in Chile. And the Argentinians say, gringo, gringo, you can't go there. They'll get you. Well, the radar cross-section of a Jantar 2 must be about the size of a seagull. Good luck to them. Um, and I've seen fighters, but they've never hassled me. There's the superhighway. Mm. And that doesn't go for hundreds. That goes for pretty much the whole continent down south. So... You get up early, you rock it down there, and that's why we start off closer to Mendoza. Uh, we go north, and then we go back south. Then we come back as the sun's setting. Uh, you've got to think about your, your last light. You've got to land before last light to get a record. Um, you get longer air time if you come back north. And, of course, you want to get into the top layer, this layer. And it's so magic. Um, Lamina flow. This photo, um, I was at 35,000 feet. I was using a military um, A13A uh, system and just started pressure breathing. We reckon that was past 70 thou there. Um, it's such a hoot. And the fastest I've actually recorded, um, I had a stopwatch, it was 32 metres per second. 32 knots, you know. Forget your good thermals at 12 knots, you know, a good day at, out in the desert. Um, 32 metres per second. I was getting so worried, I actually pulled dive brakes and went behind. That's my normal setup, the old well nav. Um, when I was setting speed and distance records, uh, this day I was aiming for uh, 1,500, well, it was 1,562. Um, you have to fly 270 kilometers from Chosmalau to the start point. That's 270 kilometers you can't log <laughs> in the record. You start here and um, you're thermaling, then you get down into the, the wave, join that and off you go. Um, and then you've got to come back. Um, this was coming back, and I was up high and just drifted down to get back there. 
This is the area where all the speed triangles are done. This is the fastest place on the planet for gliders. That is a fact. There's no, no discussion. A fact. Um, I set the 100 speed triangle to uh, 300, 500, um, 750 in this area. I actually was taking photos. This was during the 100 uh, speed triangle for standard class. Um, I set it at 198.98 kph, um, which took out at that stage standard 15 metre and open class records for Australia. Um, but I was taking photos and the world record was 202 at that stage. And I thought, after I landed, they said, you idiot, you could have had the world record. And I thought, oh, well, I'll do it tomorrow. Um, so you get up there and there's tactics. You don't do, as you know, the full triangle. You, you, you fly along the wave, you come back to the middle of it, you go downwind dash in your ground speed. I kid you not, it's close to 400 kilometers an hour. Um, and then you've got to work your way back up quickly without falling out of the wave. There's various tactics. This one, I waited six, seven hours for this whole system to blow through. That killed two Hungarian guys. They were world champions, glider champions. They were an Ash 25. Uh, they were trying to land. This system, they speared in, killed. We found them about uh, two weeks later. Uh, the aircraft cooked off. Um, the oxygen system, they were all burnt and coyotes had got them. But yeah, very sad. So you've got to think about what you're doing. This is world-class stuff. Dive brakes and I was still going up, as I said. Unbelievable. I tend to come in faster and hotter than a lot of other pilots because wind shear and all that. And one day I was landing and I teach English over in the school at Charles Malau on Thursday nights and they brought all the school kids out here and they're all standing around here. I came in and I'm gliding along and they all were on the tarmac. So I had to clean up, went over the top of them and they thought, oh yeah, that's pretty you know, buzzing us. I was shitting myself, went off the end of the runway into the scrub and it pulled up six feet from a barbed wire fence. Catapitation was on the cards. What all that was, me ridge soaring onto the volcano Truman <laughs> and then punching into wave. Yeeha. And off I go again. Yes, there's accidents. Yeah, that's that wasn't uh, the Ash 25, that was IS 28. Mm. And then they put a Jantar, not a good photo, and then everyone knew I flew a Jantar and they thought, well, that's the end of Rick with a silent P. Um, and it took a couple of days for me to find out that this was in the paper. Yes, this is me. And yes, that is a volcano. And Klaus took a photo of me. I thermal up sulfuric acid. Apparently, I'm the only idiot that's done it. Um, something different. Classic risk management. The big boys, they have their motors. And this was the early 2000s. That and it was the first time I'd saw a motor glider and I thought, oh, I want one of those when I grow up. And Klaus is STEMI, setting world records. Might as well, I, I said, nah, this is not real flying, it's power flying. Checking, uh, that's Klaus, me, when I wasn't as blonde. And uh, Faldi, Osvaldo, checking my records. Argentina's top pilot, missing fingers, because he got into um, ultralights and he had one of these gyrocopters and he stuck his hand up to stop the prop, took his two fingers. Anyway, but you can see that volcano causes these sort of clouds. Insane. I don't trust anyone, so that's my Janta. I get the local SAS, they come along and they guard my glider. Can't trust any bastard. Now, what actually happened, because it's an active military strip, they have war games and um, <laughs> C-130s, these were a parachute regiment. And they parachuted out and they took over the airstrip and um, I was the only gringo there, but that was a lot of fun. One night we figured out uh, factually that this is more world record holders in this one room uh, in any other sport ever. So... Pretty much everyone's got world record in that photo, in gliding. Me getting arty, full moon. 
Okay. Ah, uh, if you get the chance to fly Chile, and I know Al Wilson has, fly Chile. Ridge saw, because you won't wave is all Argentina. This is all ridge soaring and dynamic and thermally. And you come back over Santiago, and they say um, turn downwind at the Polo Club, follow the river. Well, there's the river, there's the highway, and there's your runway. I flew the Super Cub to get a area for mill first, and then uh, they said, off you go. Then, um, as I mentioned early on, um, one Steve Fawcett, well, I got this phone call at 2.30 in the morning, as they always do. Is that Rick Agnew? This is supposed to be an American accent. Uh, yes, who speaks? Steve Fawcett. And I thought, I've heard that name. Bullshit. Thinking it's my SAS mate. So I hung up. Ten minutes later, don't hang up on me. It's Steve Fawcett. I want your oxygen system. I'm going to fly a balloon around the world. Sure you are. If you're Steve Fawcett, you can buy the oxygen factory and everything else. Anyway, we got talking, got him into gliding, um, and then he set world altitude records. Uh, why the balloon is not in the Smithsonian? Because he crashed it and gave the envelope uh, to the farmer, and um, it was all torn and shredded. The baskets in the Smithsonian. Then he flew uh, Voyager around the world. Uh, it was a remote control, but he wanted to land it, crashed it. It's not in the Smithsonian. Then he got into gliding. So recently, that's the world altitude record, but it was a 40,000-foot 40, aerotow. Think of the big bucks. What? Yep, I kid you not. Your super can pay for that, Kerry. Well, you keep in your glove box, I know. But our, our good mate, Morgan Sandercock. Morgan, um, well, <clears throat> Pearl and one, they flew in New Zealand, and Steve said, how high did you get this season? What did it cost you? And I said, well, it cost me um, uh, $53 or whatever for the launch. And I got to uh, 27000 or something. And he, he spent $3 million of his dollars and he got to 22000 And he had the shits like you wouldn't believe. Um, he bought brand new DG505s straight out of the factory, two of them. Steve Fawcett, because he can. He's got the money. Here's Steve, he, and that's, that's Terry Delore. This is in Argentina. We convinced him to move to Argentina and fly real wave. Terry wouldn't let Steve fly. Um, Steve got so excited, ran across the tarmac, tripped over, broke his sunnies, hence no little... Um, I used to let Steve fly, not the landing, mind you. Uh, it's his money. He never paid me. Um, he paid the others. So then Perlin Project started. So we all know about Perlin, started in New Zealand. Um, the aim to get to 100,000. Um, this is in Argentina, Steve's aircraft, SF, two Australian pilots. Um, we arrived right down past Bariloche at uh, Califati, El Califati. He's smart. That's why he was a squee in air. Us idiots use our own money. But he got NASA to sponsor. Have a look at that on the joystick. We'll come back to that. Joystick, that was Steve's little thing. Liquid oxygen. Spacesuits, three quarters of a million US each. And it takes you about three quarters of an hour to get in it. And as soon as you get in it, you're dying for a leak. I tell you, it's unbelievable. Steve and Ina Everson, he, he's just recently died. Uh, Ina is the brains behind Perlin. He, he's a genius, test pilot, F-15s and all the X-series. He is better than Chuck Yeager, I believe. He was the right stuff. And Steve, yeah, he conned Steve to pay money. That's me, actually. Now, back to this thing. It looks a bit rude, but when you've got a, a space suit on, you can't close the mitts, your hand, to get on that bony little okay. uh, stick. So they said, well, we'll get tape and we'll just thread the tape around it and get it fatter. And I go, no, 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 no. We'll go up to the flight lounge. I saw a, a kiddie shop and Hunter would be bear and a honey bear pot. So that's the honey bear pot I stuck on there. Worked for me. There's Steve. It's supposed to be pre-breathing, getting rid of nitrogen. 
Steve was such a goer, he got first day covers and postcards and put them in there. So when he got a world record, he'd sell these on eBay for more money. Look at the size of that going up. Unbelievable. That's a local aircraft. It's sort of like a super cub. Look at the all up weight. Aero tow. They went and set the record. Steve uh, started getting bored in Argentina and then um, started other ideas. He wanted to break the land speed record for cars. And you probably heard the story. He, he went to um, uh, Minden and uh, all that sort of stuff. And then um, Paris Hilton's grandfather, uh, uh, the Hilton Cup fame. And Baron. Baron Hilton. And um, went there. Steve got a, a, a bug smasher, went for a flight, didn't tell anyone he was going south and told them he was all supposed to be going north. He speared in. <laughs> Roll cloud and rotor got him. They found a, a, a bushwalker walking through the, the, the mountain range, found a burnt $100 note and thought, oh, there might be more, and then found the wreckage of the aircraft and the coyotes eaten Steve. I was getting a lot of phone calls from press saying, you know, do you know where Steve is? And after a while, I got annoyed with this and I said, yeah, yeah, he's in Vegas. I saw him there with uh, uh, Princess Di and Elvis. You know, so they gave up ringing me. So that was the end of Perlin until Enard decided, we've got to get it going. And this is when uh, Morgan Sandicock stumped up money. I, I didn't have the cash. And Morgan bought in and more power to him. And he was one of the original Pearl and Two people. And they had um, Bert Rutan to design an aircraft. And we all seen the pictures, design, design. And these aren't my photos. I've stolen them off their website. Um, that's inside the Pearl and Two. And they're doing great things. Um, brilliant stuff. Higher than SR-71s and U-2s. So... Uh, U.S. Air Force is very interested. NASA's sort of interested. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, um, Klaus is doing the Mountain Wave Project, doing really phenomenal good work. Um, and no one believes anything else, so they all have data loggers and all that sort of stuff. So that's sort of the future of what's going on there. Um, I miss Steve. He was a bit of a goer. Um, so there we go. That's the end of the brief. Questions, comments, throw things. I think, uh, Rick, uh, I've been chatting with Kerry in the background, and uh, she pointed out that uh, Ailsa went and broke the 100-kilometre uh, triangle speed record uh, in Benalla uh, recently, doing 205. That's right. Uh, so that's uh, that's pretty phenomenal. So uh, uh, there's one for Victoria anyway. The... Um... Most of my speed records, a bit of paper here, you know, sort of, they're probably died now because I think I did that, uh, the 100, I don't know, it's, it's probably, they've all changed now when we became Oceana and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it was heady days back then, doing out and returns and doing the, the 1,000 Ks and um, the first one I fell out and had to thermal out. Um it took over 12 hours. The longest flight I've ever had in anything is in a glider. 10 minutes shy of 17 hours. 16 hours, 51 minutes it was. 16 hours, 51 minutes in a glider. Yeah. Um, I got out of the glider. The next day I could hardly walk. I was stuffed. And um, it was, I think I, I had about three or four days off just recovering. Um Totally stuffed, mentally stuffed. So there we go. So if you get the chance, come up to Bunyan. You're always welcome. A lot of clubs from all over the place. Um, uh, Frank um, from South Australia, help me with the names. He he gets pre-COVID days, uh, people to come up and they, they have wave camp. Uh, this year we had to cancel it. Um, but it, we've got a clubhouse. We get tugs in and it's a real hoot. A lot of the Canberra Gliding Club people don't turn up during wave camp. We've, we've sort of spoiled. We've got it when we can get a tuggy and a couple of launches. It's on. Today would have been on, except stupid lockdown. Mm. 
Yeah, you know, so I, was, I was looking at uh, SkySight and there was a, a uh, seven or eight knot uh, lift all along the top of uh, uh, the, the main range. Well, we've looked at it. Fitzy and I have looked at it. We could probably be, do a downwind dash from uh, Bunyan um, to Melbourne. Getting back, you'd probably end up landing at Sale. Um, it's never been done before, that, that sort of flight in wave in Australia. Um, so that's where it's starting opening up with these predictive tools. And yes, if I had money, or you guys can sponsor me and get me a LX9000 and something, and I'll whack that in the 55. Um, I still believe in slide rules, paper maps, and look out the window, you know, real flying. So a serious question for the Geelong guys. If you're interested in uh, a week at Bunyan, uh, I think that's possibly something that uh, that we could organise. Yeah, and um, and on the non-wave days, you go skiing. Yeah, and the advantage uh, for us, or for me, is that my youngest daughter uh, lives at Jindabyne and she rubs, runs the kitchen in the largest pub in town. So, uh, I, uh, <laughs> so I'm sure, I'm sure uh, Amy would love to meet you, Kerry, and I'll put a good word in for you. Pity I didn't get to Jindabyne this year. <laughs> Glad to stop me. <laughs> well, the Merediths probably owe you a, a, a meal or two <laughs> at the snow. But, um, yeah, seriously, for the uh, Geelong guys, if, if you're interested in a wave camp. Yep, uh, we, can, we can do it because I'm the club captain, whatever that means. I was the inaugural one. Um, then I went overseas and blah, 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 and they dobbed me in again. So I'm supposed to G up flying, so come and fly with us. You're more than welcome and bring, you know, your mates and mate S's. Um, and we, we are friendly, despite what you may think. And not they're not mad like me. Um, I'm probably a, a little bit different with my mountain climbing and um, and got to go next year back to K2, attempt that. I've got within 300 metres of the summit of K2. Um, yes. Any Is that a harder climb than Everest, Rick? Oh, the hardest climb.